All right, everyone's been telling me to watch the genius of Sword Art Online Abridged, Fixing What's Broken Part 1. There's a Part 2-2 two two that we'll cover. Let's see what they have to say. <clears throat> Sword Art Online huh? sucks. <laughs> thank you, thank you. Click here to subscribe, follow me All on right, that, that's the video, guys. Thank you for tuning in. If you're still here, if you didn't do this reaction, come on, there's more video to God. Come on, let's go. Twitter, leave a like and name your firstborn daughter after me. By now, it's no secret that Sword Art Online is terrible. It is so terrible that the fact that the fact that it's terrible is a meme is a meme. And that's- I think that SAO sucks is a... Uh... <laughs> It's, it's an opinion held by many, definitely, right? And I've never even seen this until recently. This shit came out in 2020, like 2012, 2013 or some shit. And all I've heard about SAO is how fucking bad it is. But it's so popular. It's so fucking popular. Even though people hate on this show, it is so fucking popular. Why is that? I think a lot of people grew up watching SAO as their first anime ever. When it first started in season t uh, in like um, 2012 or 20 uh, 2013, right? It had a very good interesting and appealing hook, right? That you're stuck in a video game and if you die, then you die in real life, right? That was very compelling and I bet a lot of kids watching this show for the first time, you know, they love that and a lot, obviously those kids are not gonna be the harshest critics ever, right? And as they grow up, I'm sure there's a bit of like a nostalgic factor where they intentionally are able to ignore or even just let go of all the terrible writing and all the different plot holes in this show because, you know, it's their first ever anime, right? There's a nostalgia factor to it, so I think that's why this show is so beloved even though apparently it sucks. That's a real shame because Hunger Games Online with sword lasers is probably the best idea to come out of Japan since ritually cannibalizing their enemies is an intimidation tactic during World War II. Look it wow. up. To those of you who are as disappointed as I was with Reki Kawahara's shitty writing, awful pacing, bland characters. Reki Shirohara is the author of SAO. Ignorance of basic game design principles, misogyny, lack of attention to... Misogyny. True! I was not in the fucking kitchen and make me a goddamn sandwich. I mean, this, I, I, no, I think the abridge made it even more funnier, right? The misogyny elements, but other than that, yeah, maybe, yeah, yeah. Detail, complete disregard for internal consistency. That's a lot. Lack of knowledge of what made his narrative interesting in the first place and voyeuristic sexual exploitation of prepubescent girls have. Voyeuristic? Wait, what was their voyeurism? Where, was, was there voyeurism? Wait, also, am I allowed to watch this right now? Are, are, are we talking about stuff that happens in part two? Is, is this part two content of SAO abridged as well included? Because I thought people said that I can watch this after I watch, you know, after part one is over. I don't remember voyeurism in part one. Do you guys know? Maybe he's talking about what Oberon does it to Asuna later on. I don't fucking know. Have I got the anime for you? There's this idea called percussive maintenance, where you okay. take a broken electronic device and beat it into submission until it decides to work. And that is exactly what Something Witty Entertainment did with Sword Art Online Abridged. Okay. Criticism of SAO is nothing new, but SAO Abridged thrashes its source material so thoroughly that it loops right back around to becoming a loving reconstruction of everything that we all hoped SAO was going to be. From the characters to the pacing to the animation, SAO Abridged isn't just a great parody, it's a better show than Sword Art Online. Bef hot take? Maybe not a hot take? Maybe this is true. In fact, the season finale, I felt like I got way more closure in the season finale. It's part one, I mean, it's part one finale of the abridged compared to the, you know, the actual anime episode. Because they actually, you know, Kaiba was like, why'd you do this, Kaiba? And he's like, <laughs> it's a feature, not a bug. <laughs> and I'm like, okay, I don't know. There's, there's a many moments in SAO Bridge where I felt like it was like way funnier than the original anime because like what is the point of an abridged the bridge is to give an english dub over anime adaptation and like kind of like shit on it right it's like because you is it okay to call it a deconstruction you're basically taking the anime episode you're breaking it down into individual components to kind of shit on and then you know you make it back into this final product where you're watching this and it's like a parody of the original anime and it's even had its own like separate like memes and little references going. I felt the abridged was a brilliant work. Before we get into exactly how SAO abridged fixes the innumerable flaws in its source material, all while remaining one of the funniest abridged series on the market, let's talk about names. This 
is SEO abridged the best abridged compared to everything else? There's a lot of people telling me that ever since I finished the SEO abridged, they were like, yo, there's so many different abridged shows that you should check out. I think Dragon Ball was one of them. I think people were saying like Fist of the North Star. I mean, we can't really watch those until we actually watch those specific animes, right? But I think that like SEO abridged definitely is a huge title that everyone kind of knows, right? If you say abridged, they'll probably kind of recognize DBZ or SAO. This is Kirito, Asuna, and Klein. They're the three most important- Why the fuck is Klein so short? Yo, why are you doing balls deep 69 this dirty? ...characters in Sword Art Online, and I'm going to have to talk about them a lot. This is Kirito, Asuna, and Klein. They're the Way three bigger. most important characters in Sword Art Online abridged, and I'm going to have to talk about them a lot. You see the problem here. So in- uh, He, 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 he double down, but Klein at Ball Steep 69 is bigger now. In order to avoid confusion and to keep myself from having to say abridged Kirito 347 times, let me oh, introduce okay, okay, you to okay. some new friends of mine. Kurt, Ass, and Balls Deep 69. Here we go, they got new names. We got Kurt, Asuna, and Ball Steep 69. Don't forget about Tiffany. 69. Everybody see what I'm doing here? Yeah? Yes, okay. I do. Okay, 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 okay. The most noteworthy and impactful change that SAO Abridge makes over the original is that people aren't stupid. So many of Sword Art Online's conflicts compared yeah, there's a lot of moments where they actually kind of talk about the absurdity of what's going on. It's like, yo, why the fuck did you do that, right? That's one of the best things about a bridge where it can kind of like make fun of the stupid plot points that could have been resolved by just a little bit of critical thinking. ...avoided if the people involved didn't have the mental capacities of a sleep-deprived cabbage. Take the moonlit black cats, for example. SAO attempts to justify Kirito's badass <laughs> no, not Sachi. by implying that he feels responsible for what happened to the cats and doesn't want to join any other guild to keep yeah. people safe. This makes them incredibly important. Sure is a shame they have the collective IQ of a coffee table. Hey, we have some time to kill. How about we make some extra cash fighting death monsters? <laughs> Well, they were trying to like get a house and stuff, right? No. Well, no. They were trying to like get. Uh, they were trying to be efficient with the XP farming. They were talking about getting a house. They were talking about dreams and hopes of having their own different. Did they even mention like a cattle ranch or something? I forget, right? I forget. But basically, they went out of their way to do some risky shit, even though they shouldn't have. And I think it's also implied. It was never mentioned in the anime, but Kirito's like level because he was so much higher than the party that. The monsters, that dungeon, that special thing that happened was actually Kirito's fault and it would have never happened if Kirito was not like an over-leveled character in the same party. In this death dungeon know. where we could die. Never mind that our guild leader is gone. We need chairs. Hey, he's getting a house, bro. He's gonna come back and, and fucking jump off the bridge after getting a house, though. Not to mention the whole reason they all get killed is because Mr. MLG Pro here finds a treasure chest in an empty room and opens it. And I feel like... See, imagine if this shit happened in Freedom, bro. Imagine if Freedom fucking did this shit and then someone actually fucking died after opening a mimic. Unfortunately, it's not that kind of show here. Like, that's all that needs to be said to show that this guy is about as smart as Bakugo. Oh, God, what have I done? Uh, Bakugo is a character from... Oh, that's, that's a lot of fucking hate comments, bro, huh? I guess he covered My Hero Academia content. And there's a lot of haters. There's a, they, someone just literally said, unalive yourself. That's the craziest thing. That's one of the craziest thing in um, content creation. This is on kind of off topic is like if you disagree with someone's opinion about a fucking 2D character, right? Like people will send death threats. These animals online because they have the screen protecting them and like being anonymous online. Like people will say rancid, horrible shit to you over fucking, you know, a conflict of opinion of, about fucking a 2D character in fucking anime. Like, get a fucking hold of yourself. These are fucking deranged lunatics that has nothing better to do. Fucking just terminally online. Got nothing going on for themselves. So they spew out hatred shit like this. Just saying, unalive yourself over the opinion of fucking Bakugo and My Hero Academia. Like, you really have nothing better going on for your life, huh? Done, but the cats aren't off the hook. Let's talk about Kirito. Kirito hides his level from the moonlit black cats because mm -hmm. if they knew his real level, they would Beater! He's a beater! Wouldn't want him around. Why? Exactly. Why though? I never understood why they fucking like that. What's that guy in the spiky hair, dude? Like, he's the one that in the beginning of episode two, at the end of episode two, after we fucking save them, you know, Diabel dies and Kirito fucking save them. And he's like, oh, you're a beater. You have all this knowledge. You have all this knowledge about how this game works that we could use to help proceed. But it's like, instead of doing that, we're going to fucking outcast you. That's one of the fucking dumbest shit fucking possible. Even right here, right? If they knew that Kirito was stronger, then it's going to be like, oh, 
we're gonna outcast him because he's a strong person who knows the most official leveling routes and could even protect us in the party but oh god we don't want that happening why are you forgetting that this is a death game why would anybody not want to hang out with people who are good at the death game now that's Yu-Gi-Oh, right? Yu-Gi-Oh is also a death game? Yo, sh should, we, should we watch Yu-Gi-Oh on the cartoon channel or second channel? I don't know. Now, it's never explicitly stated why hanging out with someone at a much higher level than you is a liability because Sword Art Online, because Sword Art Online. But as far as I can tell, Kiri... <laughs> because Sword Art Online, because Sword Art Online. So being around makes higher level monsters spawn. And if that's the case, then Kirito knows that getting into a combat situation with the cats is a bad idea. So so he is acknowledging, you know, what's missed from the anime. The implication that higher level, hanging out with lower level people, some bad shit could happen. Okay. So why did he say nothing when it was suggested that they go into the dungeon? If why didn't he say anything? Was there any point? No. He, he kind of like tried to tell them like this is a bad idea. But beyond that, he never did anything. Why? Because the black cast was like a comfortable environment that he wanted to be around. That's pretty much it. And then, I guess then he put his own fucking party at risk by not telling them the truth about his own level. So this is all Kirito's fault. If he knew that his very presence would cause Trogdor to come in and burninate all his friends, then congratulations, Kirito. You are so socially incompetent that you committed manslaughter. But he is so socially incompetent, right? This character is a fucking edgy cringe lord, fucking 13, 14 year old, like start, right? So I feel like even though He's absolutely right. What this guy is saying, right? What is his name? What is his name? The explanation point. He is absolutely correct in what he's describing Akirito. But at the same time, is that not how that character was supposed to be? Right? He's a fucking idiot. He's an edgelord. He found some, he found an environment of, it's, it's almost like, a, it's like a, a place of respite where he can kind of chill and hang out with the moonlit black cats. But due to his incompetence, due to his socially incompetent behavior, he was not able to communicate that properly and people died. And then he kind of harbors that guilt throughout the show. Sachi PTSD. Even to the point where he like kind of pushes off Balls Deep 69, which he has been doing since like episode one. So he is absolutely right in the sense that this is fucking stupid. But does that not kind of make sense for this character that's meant to be perhaps fucking stupid? Bully for you. The actions of these characters are completely incongruous with a world in which people have both a fear of death and a basic okay. knowledge of cause and effect. Which I agree, right? This is a fucking death game. Why would you even risk going in there? He's correct about that. Which is why Sword Art Online Abridged completely rewrites this entire plot line. For starters, not only does Kurt not hide his level from Kada, Kada approaches him because he wants a higher level player in his okay. guild, which, you know, makes sense. Why does Gary run right into the most obvious trap since this? Because he's an NPC. What the fuck is going on there? Loot. And why are they in the dungeon? <laughs> What's Gary's NPC line? It's like, my family is in trouble. I forget. It's always an NPC line that Gary kept saying. In the first place for chairs? Nope. Because they're in debt to the mob and have to find a replacement right. for the special Fluffles. item that Charisma Hat stole. This slash and burn approach to adaptation is what allows something witty entertainment to take Sword Art Online from a barely coherent mess of broken dreams and lost potential and turn it into a series that isn't downright insulting to anybody who has a better critical eye than a trained eggplant. But it's like most kids watching this is never gonna pick up these themes and even they think about stuff like that. But for sure, what Sword Art Online Abridged does to people that may think a little bit more, you know, critically about anime, what they did was beautiful. In addition to the obvious benefit of logic, these massive changes result in more complex and meaningful character development. That's, uh, that's, that's her blacksmith girl, like Elizabeth, right? ...that happens in SAO proper, and not just among the main cast. Even the most minor of side characters are... Fuck that guy. The military dude, that guy fucking sucks. ...given unique personalities and quirks that tend to be entirely absent from the original series. This allows something witty to turn totally forgettable, generic, non-characters like this into real people with personalities... Uh, that's the, 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 that, that girl's the one that we saw with the Yui episode where her husband was trapped, right? Yeah, yeah, I remember that. ...actually care about. In SAO, Godfrey is, this guy's name is Godfrey. <laughs> the fucking roleplay god, dude. Godfrey showed up for one episode with the fucking Vegeta hairline. I thought he was gonna be funny and he just roleplayed the entire time and he just got his ass fucking clapped. ...is a plot device whose only purpose in the narrative is to get Kirito and Kuro yep. alone together and yep. then get killed just so yep. the knows that this guy is crazy. Which we all knew from the beginning before even this happened because the duel is like, bro, it's like, my lady, I need to duel into 
protect Asna from you, but it's like, ain't nobody fucking asking for your help, you fucking creep, but Godfrey's character? Really, what the fuck was the point of that guy, huh? What was the point? That's literally it. He exists only to get fucking Kirito and Kuradio stuck in the fucking cavern, the canyons. And then I guess eventually for Asna to save and for to further push ahead with these like vulnerable moments where Kirito almost dies, Asna is there, then they fall more deeply in love, right? That's pretty much the entire point, right? In Abridged, he's Godfrey the role player, the quirky, endearing doof who badly quotes Shakespeare and really seems to be trying to make everyone around him happy. And when Kuridio stabs him and he breaks character to start <laughs> pleading for his life, that's a hilarious but yeah. still tragic moment that actually hits home and makes the viewer care about someone they didn't even remember after watching the original series i remember because this role play in the beginning not even in the abridged the original episode the way that he was like larping compared to everyone else is pretty fucking funny and then there's sachi oh the sachi series, sachi is a tool her <laughs> i didn't know we're watching classroom of the elite her entire purpose is to what is sachi's purpose her purpose is to give kirito this trauma of losing people and further distance himself away from other people right that's pretty much the entire point of sachi right and then for eventually Asuna to show up and show Kirito that, hey, life doesn't need to be this way. I'm not going to die like Sachi. To die and Asuna did die at the end. Qu quote unquote die. And give Kirito a reason to be a strong, independent swordsman yep. who don't need no guild. Pretty she much. has no outstanding character traits except for the ones that help her die sadder. And the Non-violent, scared of dying, cute, in love with Kirito, no self-confidence. She's saying for us. She left a little, what was it? Like, wasn't it like a Merry Christmas or some shit? I forget, was it a Happy Birthday or a Merry Christmas? One of those things. The effect that she has on Kirito is straightforward, linear, logically suspect, and poorly executed. In Abridged, she makes Kurt go through an entire emotional arc and back again, and the psychological scars that he suffers after her death stick with him long into the series' endgame and have a profound effect on everything he does. When Sachi PTSD, right? Every time it's like Sachi PTSD. When Kirito talks with Sachi under the moping bridge, she tells him that she's afraid to die. <laughs> moping bridge? Because everyone's just fucking emo under the bridge. These girls, dude. Every time. Wait, who, what else? Wasn't Elizabeth also under the fucking moping bridge at one point? Which is reasonable, but also true of literally anybody else and does nothing to endear us to her character any more than we're endeared to this guy. Kirito answers that he won't. Look I don't know who this guy is. Isn't that like My Hero Academia outfit? I don't know. More shit on that Academia. Let her die. Then she dies anyway, and he's sad. In the abridged series, Sachi's impact is much deeper and more nuanced than it is in the original. When the whole guild gets wiped in the abridged series, it's not because some inhumanly idiotic disgrace to the species falls for an obvious trap. Her ping. Because she's a fucking woman. Misogyny. Girls have terrible internet. So they don't even know what a fucking Wi-Fi and uh, what's it called, you know? Shit, Jesus Christ, now I'm gonna fucking insult myself. I don't even know the difference between an adapter and a fucking Wi-Fi. It's because Sachi sets an NPC to auto-loot because she thinks it will save time. This is a multi-layered tragic moment that enhances our sympathy for two different characters. First of all, Sachi was terrified that she was going to be the one to get her friends killed, but instead of it being an accident caused by her bad connection, the deaths of her friends were entirely the result of an avoidable mistake that was completely under her control. King. This is undercut a little bit since her party in the bridge series consists entirely of NPCs, but it's still way more impactful than I hid my level and now you're dead. And like, that's not even implied in the anime, right? Like I hid my level and now you're dead is not even like stated specifically in the anime. Cause that's like shit apparently that's been mentioned maybe in the light novel. The anime never mentioned that. Now you, you have to heavily like think and like, maybe this is what happened, right? But the average watcher, watching like anime only watch or watching SAO when they see the scene they're gonna be like what the fuck happened there they would never question about oh the Kirito's level you know somehow you know make this dungeon more dangerous Ed. her effect on Kurt is significantly deeper as well from the beginning of the abridged series Kurt has been a self-assured overconfident dickbag with a superiority complex who sees the suffering of weaker players as a source of entertainment he doesn't he hate like humanity as well he says he doesn't want to team up with other players because they're a bunch of mouth breathing neckbeards and DML yeah. praises him for being so wise when he goes on his rant about how lions don't concern themselves with the opinions of sheep, reinforcing that he is right to see the people around him as useless, inferior beings. When Sachi tells him that she's afraid her lag is going to get everyone she loves killed, Kurt is confronted with something that he can't find a way to mock, which makes him question his cocksure attitude for the first time in the series. What did you just say? Find a way to mock, which makes him question his cocksure attitude. 
cocksure attitude. That's a word that I did not realize existed. Dude, for the first time in the series. The ensuing conversation makes Kurt see the error of his ways, and he resolves to stop being a sociopathic fuck muncher and give people a shot. Sachi is Kurt's way of giving humanity a chance to prove its worth. Totally different from the SAO proper, where Sachi was used to make Kirito alienate himself from people more and more and become independent and isolated. While on the abridged, Kurt is able to take this experience and then give people more of a chance, huh? Beautiful parallels going on here, even though it's just all fucking memes. He lets himself be vulnerable to one person, one time, and that vulnerability is immediately and harshly kicked in the dick. Sachi's death reconfirms for Kurt that his former distance attitude was correct, and that allowing people to get close to you won't cause anything but pain. This Never mind, we're going back to the isolation part. This is further shown when he talks with Balls at the end of the episode. Since they first met, Kurt has always referred to Klein by his screen name, BallsDeep69, as a way of having some small bit of power over him. When Did he mention his name as Klein at one of the final episodes of A Bridge in part one? I think he did. I think there's a moment where he doesn't call him BallsDeep69 to signify that maybe... You know, he respects him more than compared to now. And he's going after the item from the Episode Christmas 3 event. 2? Klein okay. tells him that there's a chance it can resurrect players, and that knowledge gives Kurt just a little bit of hope that his vulnerability towards Sachi wasn't completely wasted. As Yo, was that item ever fucking used? I don't remember that item ever being used. As a result, he responds, Thank you, Klein, showing this other player a rare sign of respect. After risking his life against Smurf Santa to have a chance at saving Sachi, Kurt is rewarded with a hat for his trouble. Now, his attempts to show the faith charisma in humanity hat? have been foiled three times. First, when Sachi died. Second, when the hope at reviving her was taken from him. And third, when Klein betrayed him by giving him that hope in the first place. Even if Sword Art Online had accomplished what it are these all supposed to be foils? Like tin foils, you know, foils, right? These are like, um, I'm not smart enough to describe what a fucking foil is, but it's like more literary me me mechanisms, right? Klein betrayed him by giving him that hope in the first place. Yeah. Even if Sword Art Online had accomplished what it set out to do with Sachi's character, Kirito wouldn't have had an arc so much as a straight line going from a relatively nice, sociable dude who's a bit on the awkward side to a self-imposed pariah who's too afraid of getting other people killed to join up with them. In Abridged, he starts with posturing and presenting himself as a total ass who doesn't care about humanity at all. What the fuck is this fucking Y axis, bro? Sasuke's edgy evil twin. People who are inconsistent with text formatting. Jeffrey Dahmer. Paul Ryan. Ducks. All while actually Quirky. really wanting people to like him. Then he gets that point of view reaffirmed after the fight against Ilfang. Then questioned by Sachi. Then reaffirmed by Sachi. Then questioned by Balls. Then reaffirmed by Santa in an emotional cycle that beats him down so far into the dirt that he thanks Balls for showing him that there was still a part of him that could love people because now that he knows where to find it, he can kill it forever. This is normally the part in this video where I would really start delving into Kurt's character, but I'm not going to do that. Why? Instead, since there's enough content about him, ass, and Yui to make that its own video, I'm gonna make that its own video. For now, let's go back to this whole thing about people not being stupid and talk about Kayaba. Trivia question. Why Kayaba. does Kayaba Akihiko make Sword Art Online kill people? Don't there is no fucking reason. That was never fucking answered the anime, and everyone's saying the most cop-out answer is get a god complex. That's it, right? His, his explanation... Kaiba's explanation of why he fucking made SAO in the beginning was to chase after this dream that he had, the fantasy of a floating castle. Something so different from reality, where he could feel immersed and live a different life in. But it's like, that doesn't fucking answer the fact why people had to die. And I think that, at the end of the day, the dying thing just added, it's like its own spice. It's like a steak that never existed before, right? If people didn't die in SAO, I don't think people would watch it, right? I think that people die in game, people die in life, is such a high level stake that everyone in episode 1 got hooked by. But maybe the author didn't really realize why that had to even begin in the first place. Because he's like, shit, well fuck, I don't have an explanation. I thought it would be just fucking cool, I thought it would get people hyped up. But it's like, why did Kaiba actually make people die in the game, right? In real life, people die in the game. And then the abridge says it's a fucking, it's a feature, not a bug. That's pretty much it. Don't remember? Neither does he! Ain't that some shit? I mean, I get it, man. Sometimes you just do things. No worries, I'm sure that'll hold up in court. The lack of compelling motivation isn't just stupid. It turns Akihiko from a potentially brilliant character into a plot contrivance, acting Agreed. as yet another sword in the back of SAO's potential. Thanks. Like, 
Kaiba was so mysterious and the realization that, you know, Heathcliff with Kaiba and, and the fact that he might be even waiting for us in the Ruby Palace, right? What did he say? He said at the end, Ruby Palace at the very top, I will be waiting for you, right? So that implies that this could still happen. Who knows what the fuck Kaiba is doing? But the explanation when we asked him, like, what, what did you even do this? He's like, <laughs> I watched this movie and there was this floating castle. It was cool. And he's like, why did you kill them? Goodbye. Thankfully, as usual, the Abridged series is here to save the day. In SAO Abridged, the first few SAO-related deaths were the result of a glitch in the system that was caused by a rushed release. And since Akihiko is crazy from having yep, gone it's a three bug. weeks without it's a sleep feature, to get though. the damn thing finished, he panics and locks everyone in the game so that he can pretend it's all part of some master plan until he finds a way to keep the cops off his back. The writers of the Abridged series realized that there was no possible motivation that a sane man could have for doing all this, so they needed to add some insanity to Kayaba's character. Problem. Right, and then the anime proper, people's justification, people's defense for why Kaiba killed us again, just simple god complex, which I think at the end of the day is a pretty cheap answer. It's a very cop-out answer, but it's the only kind of answer that kind of presents itself, because like, what else would, would, would he kill them, right? What, what reason is there? Maybe just a fucking sick freak? I don't know. Problem is, they'd already portrayed him as being ruthlessly competent when he's playing the part of Heathcliff. Their reconciliation of these two portrayals- <laughs> That's a cliff bar. Is that a cliff bar? Heathcliff. Uh, you know, the cliff fucking snack bar? I'm not really sure. The packaging looks funny. It looks like a fucking snack bar. ...of Agihiko both make sense and play into his backstory as a game developer. Since nothing drives game developers insane, like being overworked, underslept, and working on a deadline they know they can't keep. Speaking of Heathcliff, then there's that whole, you fools, I was Kayaba the whole time. Bit. Yeah? Unless you've seen Sword Art Online, there is no way to properly appreciate how jarring this scene is. We all know that as... The moment Kaiba, sorry, Heathcliff realized, sorry, Heathcliff um, uh, basically told everyone that he was Kaiba. Well, he didn't because Kirito, what happened? There is a moment, it's been kind of teased, right, in the duel where time stopped for a bit and Kaiba it hurt. Kaiba kind of cheated. And then there's the boss fight where there was something sus about Kaiba's health bar. And then Kirito tried to like get a sneak attack on him. And when he did, it's like immortal object, right? It's like, ah, you're a fucking GM. What's going on? And then that's the revelation, right? SAO has pacing problems, but there is a big difference between lingering on one scene a little bit too long and ending the story 25 floors early because the writers just got bored. That's the thing. It's like, damn, we, I, I don't know. I was kind of compelled by the whole climbing up to the hundredth floor and clearing it. But it's like, we were... We just finished in the 75th? Is that intentional? I don't, I don't know. Pe some people are telling me like, no, 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 bro. Trust, trust, trust. Just trust the process. Apparently the story could go back to the castle. I'm not really sure. But didn't Kaiba also say like, uh, you know, the Ruby Palace and then the top of the castle. I will be waiting there for you one day. Didn't you even mention something like that during the final scenes of part one? And the way this happens doesn't even make sense. There are two key pieces of evidence backing up Kirito's shocking revelation that the leader of the Knights of the Blood Oath was actually Kayaba Akihiko in a pair of Groucho Marx glasses. He moved really, really fast one time. He stopped and time. nothing less fun than watching someone else play an RPG. With the first part, Kirito seems to forget that Sword Art Online is an irreparably broken game. Game. The unique skill system makes it so that there's nothing stopping a player from being able to do pretty much anything. Well, I feel like that, that he's absolutely correct, right? The unique skill system, right, kind of bullshit. But the whole point of that was to kind of show that, hey, this main character, Kirito, he's the only one that can dual wield. And dual wielding, dual wielding is pretty fucking cool, right? And to the bunch of 12 year old kids watching their first ever anime, and they see Kirito go Starburst stream, and he fucking goes like to the Gleam Eyes, and this fucking Sword, sword Lance playing going coffee pasta, you know, and everyone just goes like, oh my god! <laughs> <laughs> right? it's, it's pretty cool, right? It's pretty cool. It's compelling. It's, it's another X factor of why people love this show so much. But if you really think about it, you really think about it, it's like, the fuck? Kind of fucking dumb. Including moving lightning fast and blocking an otherwise perfectly placed attack. As for watching someone else play an RPG, I'm subscribed to this little channel called The Game Grumps, who just finished a playthrough of Breath of the Wild. Little channel. Give that a gander, Kirito, and tell me how boring it is watching people play RPGs after you've vicariously experienced Dan and Aaron's perfect friendship. The kind of friendship that you know is absent from your own life because you-
Isn't there some drama that happened between these two? Didn't they? I don't know if you guys know about Game Grumps, right? This is some boomer territory, but wasn't there drama and they fucking split apart and some shit? I forget. You never developed social skills in high school, and now you don't know how to talk to people because you're a shut-in neat who spends every day writing YouTube videos about shitty anime while drinking raw Baileys at noon in your apartment in Belgium. The abridged... I think that was way too specific. I think that's literally an explanation point describing himself and his life. <laughs> series plants the seeds of Kaiba's true identity in the first episode when final form floating personification of death Kaiba references Tron and Scanners. After Heath is introduced, those movie references continue. These allusions to Kaiba's favorite films create a narrative through line that allows Kurt to turn a long series of individual events into a strong case against the leader of the game's strongest guild. Or at least a stronger case than nobody could beat me in a fight without cheating. And the movie references don't only serve to make Kaiba's alter ego make sense, they also create a connection between him and Kurt. I thought that the movie reference thing was like like the whole movie reference thing was like whoa you know all about my favorite movies and they're kind of like bonding at some point right but it's like I thought this was something specific to um the people that made Sword Art Online a bridge they just loved movie references so that was like a little personal spice they were introducing but okay. Kurt also constantly makes movie references throughout the series which reflects the way in which he and Akihiko are similar. They're both massive nerds with no friends who are tired of living in a world where everyone they know is intellectually beneath them and getting trapped in this game is probably the best thing that's ever happened to both a Discord mod meets a Reddit mod in a VR game and realizes they're fucking best friends. When Kaiba finds out that Kurt gets his movie references, he is overjoyed at having finally found someone who understands him and his misanthropic Whoa. tendencies. The problem is that Kurt has undergone a whole character arc at this point and has begun to legitimately care about humanity, thus breaking the bond between him and Kaiba, which is represented when Kurt stabs Kaiba while quoting Mythbusters and Kaiba attributes the quote to Dungeon Master. Right, it's like, you know, who you gonna call? Wait, no, that's fucking Ghostbusters, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, no, I forgot I was there. And he missed the Kurt line. Never even heard of. And if that wasn't enough, then during the last scene with Kurt and Ass, when Kurt finally says, I love you to her for the first time, she says, I know, quoting Han Solo in Battlestar Galactica. Ass's okay. use of a movie reference here cements Kurt's progress as a character, showing now that he identifies more with Ass than he could have with the genocidal Kaiba. And the Abridged series doesn't just fix characterization issues either. There are also subtle changes in pacing, editing, and animation that just make it pop. There is a lot of funny moments in the abridged where like um, the characters will be kind of standing still, but then like their eyes like move around and they have like funny and, and then their facial expression will change too. I did appreciate that. For example, during the fight with Ilfang in the original series, right after the door opens, we get this brief clip of the kobold lord sitting on his throne in the dark. This subconsciously preps the viewer for a moment of tension where the army slowly walks forward with the boss looming silently over them, waiting to strike as they enter his domain. Didn't even realize Instead, that. he jumps through the air like an overstuffed tube sock out of some madman's laundry cannon and starts cutting through people like that guy from Too Many Cooks at Thanksgiving dinner. Just cutting out that one shot of Ilfang on his throne makes this whole scene flow 20 times better. I counted. And it's not just subtle changes. SAO Abridge cuts out so much unnecessary bullshit that you could make a whole new bull out of the shit, and this metaphor isn't going quite the way I wanted to, but the point is that the Einkrad arc in SAO proper is six hours long. In yeah. SAO Abridged, it's just over three, and nothing of importance is lost. Do you remember when this guy from the fishing arc talks about Baldi. soy sauce? Baldi. Do you remember this guy from the fishing arc? I do. Do you remember the fishing arc? I Neither do. Neither does SAO Abridged, and it's better for it. Yeah, I mean, what did the fishing arc really fucking provide? It was to further solidify that other people in this game exist where they've given up their will to leave the game because perhaps their life would be better here. And it provided a, it provided a little... It's almost like a, a siren's lure where it's like, nah, you don't have to, you know, go somewhere else and do that. Just chill here. Just, you know, we're going to sing the song and you're going to chill here and nothing, everything's going to be fine. I feel like um, the whole... Uh, and, and, and I guess... We did meet the fishing guy because we were going on vacation because Asuna was like, yo, Kirito's getting fucked up too much. We need to spend a little bit more time bonding. That's what was happening, right? We were bonding. It was basically like a honeymoon period. And then we met Yui there and there's like some semblance of a family. And there's repeated moments of seeing the, you know, the cabin stuff and then the fishing guy was there. The fishing stuff was maybe unnecessary. It was fun. It was just like slice of life fun out of nowhere to kind of like, you know, just refreshing stuff. But I agree. It was kind of unnecessary. Then there's the OP. My god, does this series have a stellar OP. 
every opening so far. We've only heard two of them. They've been fucking great. And the soundtrack, I think the soundtrack truly carries this show. I mean, Jeff isn't going to want to fuck it, but he's also not going to want to beat it hard enough to make small children uncomfortable like he did with the OPs of SAO proper. If nothing else, the OP is short and well edited with a fantastically chosen... Oh, he's talking about the actual abridged OP. In that case, I also agree, but 30 Seconds to Mars is fucking copyright content that gets me fucked, so I have to cut it out. Yes, I agree that both the SEO proper and the abridged opening, 30 Seconds to Mars is great. And especially when it was played during the Heathcliff versus uh, Kirito fight near the end, right? Yeah, episode 11, I think, of Abridged, or episode 12, I forget one of the ones, you know, when Kaiba and Kirito actually fight, they played the 30 seconds to Mars, it was cool, but unfortunately, I got clapped because of copyright, that part's muted, it is what it is, fuck you, YouTube theme song that actually plays during the final fight yep. against Kaiba. Great. I don't know how SAO managed to fuck up the most obvious and badass anime trope of- And the anime trope is, you know, in the most important episode, you skip the opening, and the opening plays in the triumphant moment when the main character is about to beat the opponent, right? The enemy, right? And in, in a grandiose fashion, and the opening starts playing, and you as an anime enjoyer is like, Oh shit! The opening that we always listen to was skip today's episode, but it's playing now. This must mean the heroes are about to win. Of all time, but there is nothing more hype than hearing the first bars of the opening mm -hmm. theme song play while the main character and the big bad evil guy stare each other down. And then the way the music abruptly cuts out when Kurt's sword breaks on Kaiba's shield really sells his desperation and the sense of defeat he feels at having finally been bested when so much was on the line. But the most impressive change to me is the subtle edits made to animation in the series. And I'm mm -hmm. not talking about making characters roll their eyes or the addition of new characters. I, I, I enjoyed the way that some characters, you know, their eyes were googly and moving around and their you know, facial expressions were changing. It was kind of funny. I mean the minor tweaks that don't do anything to make the episode funnier, but that seriously improve the quality of the show overall. The best example of this is the fight between Yui and this sentient Halloween costume. When Yui summons her sword in SAO proper, it's a little girl with big yeah. sword moment. And that's fine, but the idea of an unstoppably badass nine-year-old girl is kind of tired at this point, and it doesn't tell the viewer anything new about Yui except that she can summon a big sword. When this scene happens in the abridged series, there's what this happened? Cool I forget. distortion effect that really sells the idea that she's hacking into the system. Oh, there- ugh, I would have never fucking realized that. That's a little subtle, you know, change. ...to gain access to powers that she shouldn't be able to use. It takes advantage of the setting and Yui's identity as an AI while creating a link between this scene and the one where she explains that the system is going to delete her code. This animation tweak didn't have to happen. Nobody would have expected it to happen, but they did it anyway because they knew it would improve the show. Maybe hot take? I guarantee you the, the common person is never gonna fucking know. Like... There's no shot. The average person watching this, like the average person watching this is going to be able to see that and be like, oh shit, that little frame, it distorted compared to the SAO proper and this adds to the show. I agree. I completely agree what this guy is saying about how this, you know, change in animation definitely does. But it's like, damn, this only satisfies like the 0.0000001% of anime audience, which is, still, it's fine. And that's the really special thing about SAO Abridged. There are so Yes, it's special because they will, they are willing to go beyond, right, to, you know, cater towards that 0.0001% or whatever to, you know, put those details in. Like, everyone can watch it, you know, you and I can watch it and see the first time and be like, oh shit, that was kind of cool. But then someone else can watch it and realize that something happened and just like, oh shit. So it's kind of catering towards both audiences, right? The casuals and the very hardcore audience. So many Easter lazy egg. abridged series out there trying to cash in on the popularity of the trope and almost none of them do anything to improve on their source material. And Is this the moping bridge? <laughs> SAO Abridged clearly comes from a place of deep respect for what Sword Art Online could have been. And the creators go above and beyond to make good on all of the promise that Aincrad had. And I'm glad they did, because I wanted to like Sword Art Online. I think most of us wanted to like Sword Art Online. And I still like it. I can acknowledge that the show has a lot of fucking ass plot and just the plot holes are fucking shitty and none of it makes sense. But for what it's worth, it was a fun watch. I'm not really here for a fucking intricate story. I'm just here to see Kirito fucking go link start and go fucking, you know, go fucking coffee pasta starts playing in the background. He, he goes to the dual wielding Starburst stream. I, I think that's pretty much what I watched SAO for. And now, thanks to something witty entertainment, I can. Happy 20,000 subscriber special, everybody. I opened a Twitter. You know, okay. I really want to do something cool. 
or re the, the design part is basically him just plugging his you know celebration and stuff like that right yes. there's a part two of this video as well that i might check out it depends on if you guys actually give a shit about this kind of content a lot of people were begging about how i should react to part one of this so i'm gonna leave this guy out right i'm gonna leave part two uh, hanging for now guys please go sub to the channel like his videos indeed if he did there's a lot of things that i as a casual you know uh a casual fan watching this show kind of just a lot of things kind of went over my head. A lot of movie references, a lot of different references, a lot of, a lot of, a lot of things that he talked about that kind of went over my head. But I do agree. I think that the abridged SAO is probably better, if not most definitely better than the regular SAO. And I think everybody should watch it. It's definitely going to enhance your experience if you, you know, check out SAO.